congratulations. Only in America. Oh, well, you know, it's so, much, you, it's so much better than a magazine interview, because I, I realized when I was talking, I could actually stop trying to hopelessly describe it, and actually, <laughs> you could hear it. The, the thing, I mean, okay, it's, it's got Zeppelin, and it's got Portis Head, and it's got Timbuktu, and it's got all of those elements seamlessly woven together. But the other thing is, right at the heart of it is, is almost, it almost turns into, for one minute, what is the soul of a man? It almost goes back to to the blues roots of it and 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 what's always there it was always present in your work no matter how many tangents go out and it always seems to go back to that that blues core and yeah. and i'd like to talk for well let me shut up for a moment um let, let's talk about that let's talk about what got you into it and what keeps you going back to that source i i don't know i think maybe i mean and we all in this room have had a moment where music suddenly became the absolute only thing in your imagination and your mind. And, and for me as a kid, you know, I, um, I lived in England and the whole radio setup, the whole exposure to music was really very muted. The, the post-war Britain was a very uh, dour and very sort of understated and uh, a place of where there's, there wasn't a lot of dynamism. And as a kid, didn't know what was going on, you know, I was hanging out. I once wrote a song called White Clean and Neat about hanging onto my mom's skirts and just being in the warmth of my mother's uh, care and attention, but having no idea of what was going on. And then I heard Elvis. And, um, you know, I was about nine or something like that. And this voice came across in amongst Pat Boone and Johnny Mathis and all the stuff that was part of the Valium that we still know about today. Elvis came straight through, and he he had the blue note. He was listening to uh, Sleepy John Estes. He was listening to um, the guy did that's all right, Mama. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I get like that now. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> he got all this stuff. Mystery Train, he, Junior Parker's Blue Flames. I didn't know anything about the references. I didn't know anything about what I know now, where it came from. But I heard that voice. And no matter how his image has been maligned and how it ended up, when I met Elvis with Led Zeppelin uh, one evening in L.A. Oh, that alone. Hold it. Let's pause for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just drink that in for a second. Hey, we could do this all around the country, you know. <laughs> Ed McMahon here. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, Elvis wanted to know who was this. He'd adopted a kid when he was in the forces in, in Germany in 1959, some sort of pen pal extremity thing, whatever it was. And this kid was a bit younger than, uh, than the king himself and was into Zeppelin. And uh, we were involved with some people around that time who were booking our Elvis too. And Elvis wanted to know who was this bunch of guys who were selling tickets quicker than him. And uh, so they said, it's Led Zeppelin. And we went to see him two or three times. And a couple of times he made mistakes. And I remember that night at the forum, um, he was doing something like Reconsider Baby or whatever it was, the Lowell Fulson song. Yeah. And he stopped it and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we've got Led Zeppelin in here tonight. We've got to get this right. And I went. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello there. Wait a minute, wait a minute, hold it. <laughs> if we could start together, fellas, because we got Led Zeppelin out there and Jimmy Darren and a uh, whole bunch of people, and let's try to look like That's we right. know what we're doing. I mean, <laughs> so I mopped the tears away, and uh, and we got the nod that we were going to meet him afterwards, and we went to the hotel, and they had the entire top floor. No motorbikes or snakes. Uh, <laughs> they just had these trestle tables with a couple of uh, big guys. And they, they ushered us to a, a suite down the hall. It was a tacky place. It was great. It was all purples and browns. And, you know. <laughs> he carried and, that with him, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, <laughs> uh, the room was filling up with sort of secondhand Anne Margaret's. Yeah. There was a lot of and, <laughs> Well, you, you know, it has to be said, a second-hand Aunt Margaret There's is nothing still... nothing wrong with that, I'm kidding. <laughs> <you know. laughs> and I was looking at Stella Stevens over the other side of the room and uh, salivating. It was a fantastic 
a build-up. And the hall, at the end of this huge suite, which was almost as big as this room, a door kept opening and somebody kept popping their head around, just waiting for the temperature of the room and enough cosmetic to join the atmosphere <laughs> so that it was getting a bit sort of uh, feral. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then the door opened and this guy came through the door and I just, my heart jumped. It was like, whoa! Look at the way he moves, and I mean, he was just going around chairs like... <laughs> he was so, so, so cool. And I mean, of course, he wasn't supposed to be cool, but he was, you know, a bit like us, I suppose. It's like a, uh, and he came over to us, and we stood in a circle for about two or three hours talking, and people kept coming by from his retinue, from his entourage, yeah. thinking that he had enough. He was going, no, 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 no. We had a great conversation, and our manager, Led Zeppelin manager Peter Grant is sort of quite well known as probably as much as John Paul Jones, you know, big guy, a very great presence about him. And Peter was just going past us on the way to taking a seat somewhere in the homage area. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the second circle. That's right, yeah. And he lost his foot in a bit like our friend there. And he, he 350 pounds of joy. <laughs> Ended up on Vernon Presley's lap on El <laughs> and Elvis's dad was really frail with a white safari on. <laughs> and we talked anyway. We talked with Presley for about three three hours. It just went on and on and we were talking about the root and you, your question about where did it come from? It came from him and he still got it. He still was into that whole Delta thing. He, you know good rocking tonight, all that stuff that got him going in the first place. But he also knew, and he had a great sense of humor, and he knew that, that he was locked in this self-parody. I mean, when the songs dried up, when Lieber and Stoller and Pomus and Schumann, uh, when that kind of whole era of, of creative writing started to wane and things changed, I didn't want to hear Elvis doing a Neil Diamond song. Right. I wanted him, I mean, it was bad enough him coming out of the army and doing Are You Lonesome Tonight, you know. I wanted him to stay wild, to give me all those edges, that kind of, that howl that he had. But, you know, he was just amazing and spectacular. And it was just that he really opened the door to, to my, my whole love of music. And because of him, and because of the choice of his material, I found out Smiley Lewis, you know, I found all those great singers, and uh, and now all these box sets that come out. Some of the stuff that he did in the '60s and uh, was quite so well crafted. Yeah. Hank Garland's guitar playing, the stuff at RCA in Nashville. I mean, the recording of it and his humour right. in the middle of it all is is great. So it was a dream come true to meet him, but it was also. <laughs> just by chance that I heard him and it affected me the way it did. And from Elvis, straight through to the Tuareg guys in Timbuktu, right. it's a straight line. Yeah. It curves a bit, <laughs> but the blue note is there all the way through my life. It's just calling to me. Well, I, I, you know, and I, and I think that's the thing, that the, the more time that goes by, the, the easier it is for people to get confused about how important Elvis's moment was because you know because there's always the feeling that well they're not giving enough credit to Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and Little Richard and so on which which is is true right but Elvis rearranged the mainstream if Elvis hadn't taken it from how much is that doggy in the window and, and yeah. turned it into this is mainstream popular music then Little Richard and Chuck Berry and and Jerry Lee Lewis would not have had the opportunity to get through it all sure and he was also white which was oh that's right crucial because that gave him the foot in the door that maybe Alan Freed was trying to do yeah. with, with uh, Chuck and, and uh, Bo and all that sort of stuff. But he was, a, and he was just, he was a great looking guy. And he actually, that physical representation, when, by the time he got to England, guys were like hitting themselves on the head. Bang, what's going on? Who's this human being? It was fantastic in the middle of all that crap. You know, there was one shining star, and then of course you get exposed to, I mean, Bo Diddley, the man, and all that stuff. Yeah. And um, I was just, as you say, in the dark with my radio. So, so, 